This video is brought to you by Squarespace. High above the Atlantic, a new terror has emerged. A Soviet supersonic bomber with a special purpose, to hunt and destroy US aircraft carriers. In the 1960s, the Russians developed in secret a state-of-the-art bomber that was unlike the West, or frankly, the world, had ever seen. The Sakhoi Bureau might have been well known for its fighter and attack aircraft, but this new bomber could have been a game changer for the USSR and may have even changed the ultimate outcome of the Cold War. So join me today to learn about the Soviet engineering and the story behind the Soviet Valkyrie. This is the Sukhoi T-4 Sotka. In the 1960s, the Cold War was playing out in a worldwide game of spy vs spy. These espionage missions, much like James Bond, would bring over secrets to each side, some of which were plain terrifying. For the Soviets, one unsettling breakfast meeting was interrupted by the news of a new US supersonic bomber that could outdo anything they could muster the XB-70. Scrambling to defend the communist utopia that they were building, the Soviets launched two important programs to counter this new threat. One was to be the development of a brand new Mach 3 interceptor to take on the possible threat of American bombers. The other one was a supersonic bomber program much like its American counterpart, but with a much more sinister purpose. The first program eventually led to the MiG-25, but the other one is what we're covering today. Tupolev, Yakovlev and Sahoy bureaus applied for this top secret new bomber project, with the Tupolev being the logical choice because of the long tradition in bomber aviation. However, Pavel Sukhoi was always known to push for new technologies and concepts to meet the Soviet needs, and it so came to be that his bureau won the contract and it was to be the first supersonic bomber in his portfolio. So already you know this was going to be completely different to anything the Soviets had built before. The goal of this project was clear, a speed of 3,200 kilometers per hour or Mach 3, as well as the ability to carry large anti-ship missiles. After all, this aircraft would have the US carrier fleet right in its crosshairs. And so work began on the new Isdalia 100 aircraft, nicknamed the Sotka. The T-4 was made to level the playing field against the Russians' competition, the US Navy. But speaking of competition, if you want to make it or break it in the world of the internet, then you need a website. But not just any website, a Squarespace one. That's right, today's video sponsor is Squarespace and they're going to help you get even more traffic online for your business, hobby or Cold War era aviation themed YouTube channel fan site. Oh, I can wish. With a great deal for 10% off your first site and domain, but more details in a sec. Squarespace sites have the ability to run powerful email campaigns, they're optimized for mobile phones, and they have a fantastic e-commerce platform ready to go. Just add products. Plus, they have SEO tools that you need to appear on the front page of Google. I've covered a lot of crazy things here on the channel from Nazi UFOs to impossibly huge railways, but I wouldn't have been able to do it without the help from Squarespace. So to support the channel and launch your own site, go to www.squarespace.com found. As well as found and explained viewers, get 10% off your first site and domain. Back to the show. 
The T4 was very innovative for the Soviet Union, with around 600 patents directly linked to this project development, and in a minute you're going to see exactly why. You see, flying Mach 3, the same rules don't apply with ordinary aircraft. Aluminium simply couldn't handle the heat generated during flight, so instead it would need to be built out of titanium, a much stronger and much more resistant to heat metal to be used for most of the surfaces of this new bomber. And just like the fuselage of the legendary SR-71, it would be around 85% titanium all up. The T-4 was also the first Russian fly-by-wire aircraft, which was a giant technological leap for the Soviet aviation, and experiences from the project helped a lot with the further development of the Su-27. Quick side note, if you're watching right now, I have a brand new space channel where I'm doing all sorts of crazy spacecraft that were never built. So perhaps click the link down in the description to check that out after this video. The T-4 would only have a crew of two, a pilot and a weapons operator, and the design of the cockpit was very unusual. It would be very similar to a fighter jet cockpit, and the pilot would use a center stick instead of a yoke to control the aircraft. As with other large supersonic aircraft, the nose of the aircraft had a different position during the flight. While taking off or landing, the nose of the T-4 would rotate downwards 12 degrees to allow the crew better visibility. In subsonic speeds, the nose would be rotated slightly upwards, and then when going supersonic, the nose would move further up and close in the cockpit completely. The pilot would fly on instruments from this point on, and two small windows were positioned on each side just for psychological comfort. The aircraft would be powered by four Kolosov RD-36 engines, which would be integrated inside of a gondola on the bottom of the fuselage. After all the ground testing, and with four prototypes in development, it was time for the first flight. On August 22nd of 1972, the T-4 took to the skies for the first time, with test pilot Vladimir Lushin behind the controls. And yes, that's not a coincidence that he has the same last name of the famous engineer Sergei Lushin, because it was his son. Testing went on and on, however, there was a slight catch now appearing with the T-4. And to better explain it, let's talk about its actual mission profile. You see, unlike the XB-70, the mission profile of the T-4 was not to serve as a strategic bomber, rather specialized as a anti-ship bomber. The Russians were already developing strategic ICBMs for the end of the world scenario and didn't need a way to fly nukes into enemy territory. Rather, it was about leveling the playing field in a conventional war. The US Navy, unlike the Soviet one, was centered around carrier battle groups, and eliminating them would be cutting the head off a snake in a conventional war. This was to be achieved with the new KH-45 hypersonic missiles. And yes, you heard that right, hypersonic in the 1970s. These were 4.5 ton missiles flying over Mach 5, with the option of nuclear or high explosive warhead, which were made specifically to sink US carriers or totally obliterate the entire battle group if going nuclear. The T-4 would simply shoot and forget, as trying to defend yourselves against this weapon back in the 60s or 70s was almost impossible. So with everything seemingly perfect with this aircraft, what happened? The main issue with the T-4 actually lies in its serial production phase. The only factory in the USSR that had the capability to build the Sotka was the Kazan Aviation Plant, but 
they were already building the 222 at the time. With production problems with this uh, latter jet, the USSR decided to scrap it and build the Sotka instead, which is where we get to the political infighting that was the demise of the project. But Tupolev had another idea and presented instead a different option. A modernization of the 222 platform, a very deep one bearing the name, the 222M. The aircraft had a folding wing design which would allow for different mission scenarios. It was also better suited for low level flight below the radar and therefore also better suited for a sneak attack on the carrier groups. And lastly, this was way cheaper than the T4, which is kind of a big thing for the Soviet economy at the time. So whilst there was never a Russian sneak attack on a US aircraft carrier, there was a Sahoy sneak attack on Tupolev. The T4 took to the skies in January 1974 for the last time. Although a perfectly capable aircraft, it was like many other projects, a victim of budget cuts and fast changing goals of the programs back during the Cold War. The only flying prototype is today located at the Central Air Force Museum in Moscow, standing right next to its supersonic brother that we've also covered on this channel, the M50, which ironically suffered the exact same fate. So Hoy would not take this blow sitting down and would not give up on its supersonic bomber ambitions. Another opportunity opened up in the 70s, this time for a new strategic bomber of the Soviet Union and Sahoy applied with a new T4M design. This design implemented the variable geometry wings which the government preferred and put it up in competition with Tupolev and Messerschev. Spurred on by the betrayal in the past, Sukhoi went one step further and created something truly jaw-dropping called the T4MS or Isdalia 200. This was to be the first true stealth bomber in the world and you can totally bet that we're going to do a whole video about it. Sorry to be a tease, but if you want to see this video, don't forget to subscribe or jump down in the comments and tell me how mad you are. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you like this video. There's always much more cooking up in the Found and Explained kitchen. <laughs> yeah, boy. So please do hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.